Well, first thing I want to say is uh, really appreciate that suite of songs, Brandon. That was a really great, great set of songs, and I uh, just the choice was perfect, and um, really appreciated sensing God in our worship this morning. He was very much here. He is very much here, and I appreciate that so much when God is very present as we prayed this morning downstairs. It's one of the things we pray for, that God would show up, and it's nice when he does. I really appreciate what uh, Lori had to say about Push. That was just wonderful. So looking forward to having her back. Um, I don't think I really have enough time to go through my whole message, so um, I'm going to just, I kind of had like a mini message before the message, so I'll just, just do that, you know, and uh, that'll be good for today. God is good. He is really good. The, uh, the subject today is the Lord is my strength and shield, and uh, I think I will read a short psalm as kind of a benediction at the end of this that relates to that subject matter. But right for now, I just want to raise a question, and it is this question, how do we approach God? Right, how, do we, how do we properly approach Him in a way that he has established. You know, one of the things you might notice if you read in the Old Testament about the tabernacle and about the temple and about the priests and about how they did things, you just could not come any way you wanted before God. You had to come in a certain way. You had to consecrate yourself. One of the ways in which Jews consecrated themselves was that they washed. And they had, uh, by their residence, they had these these ceremonial baths, if you want to call them that, carved generally in the limestone rock with steps going down into it, and then they have fresh water running into it, and that was called a miktam. And the miktams, archaeologists use to identify where the Jews were living. Because if they do excavations and around the house, they find a miktam next to it, they know there were Jews living here, you see. So it's kind of where they can tell you know, in a given town in Palestine, how many were Jews and how many were Gentiles, perhaps. Um, because they consecrated themselves before they went up to the temple or before they went to the tabernacle. They had to be clean. Um, they didn't just come up all dirty from whatever their day's chores were. And so on. And there was certain prescribed things that had to be done. So how do we, how do we approach God in a way that's acceptable to him? There's some things that really haven't changed, you know. And if you take a look at the structure of the tabernacle, and I'm going to describe that just briefly to you, and I really hope you all can visit the reconstruction of the tabernacle, the mock-up of the tabernacle they're going to have up at the um, church on Route 70. What, what are they calling that? Messiah's mansion. Messiah's mansion, yeah. So I hope you can all go to Messiah's mansion when we're going to do that, because... <laughs> If you've never seen a mock-up of the tabernacle, to me, it's very um, touching. I, I think you really see things there that you never saw before. Even though you read about it, when you see it in person, it's, it's something. God is present, even in the reconstructions of the tabernacle. So they had a large structure that was, if I recall, and I'm just taking this all, you know, I didn't prepare this part of this. I'm just winging this. I think it's 100 cubits by 50 cubits, okay? And that structure was basically tent curtains, okay? So it wasn't with a top over it, but it was a big courtyard, and they had gates. And the tent curtains, the, 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 the curtains were supported by poles that set in silver sockets, and they were quite tall, so you couldn't stand there and peek over them, right? And then within the first courtyard when you went in, they had some furniture, if you will. There was uh, the altar the, of burnt offering, and then there was also a laver where, where the priests would wash themselves. That was kind of like their portable miktam. That's where they would wash themselves and cleanse themselves before they went into the building structure. And the building structure was built out of boards that were quite long and fairly wide, and they were covered with gold. And I've seen some artist's rendering of what the interior really looked like, stunningly beautiful. I mean, the artistry that went into that is incredible. But they had this building structure, which was 
dimensions 20 by 20? 20, 20 by 20 cubits. So, you know, you multiply um, by one and a half. So that's 30 by 30 feet in order to get feet. And it was 15 feet tall, as I recall. Okay, something like that. And then it was covered with layers of coverings. Okay, and uh, I won't get into all that, but you had the gate into the courtyard, you had the courtyard, and then you had this little building structure called the holy place. And within the holy place, there was a curtain that separated off the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. You know, that box that they carried around that had the Ten Commandments in it, and Aaron's rod which budded, and a little jar with the manna in it. And it, it's a fascinating study. I mean, there's so much symbolism in this. Interestingly, out just outside that curtain that separated the inner holy place from the holy of holies, there was a little table. And that little table was the table uh, of incense offering. And that's where they burnt the incense. And they burnt the incense all the time while they were while things were going on in the in the holy in the holy place even. Um, anyway, Psalm 100 gives us some guidance on how we approach God. Let's take a quick look at Psalm 100. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful singing. And I picture that as people on their way up to the tabernacle. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving. Right there. It tells you. You don't get through the gate without thanksgiving. Right? Enter his gates with thanksgiving. If you want to, we're, we're talking about, you know, using the model of the tabernacle to describe something that's figurative or spiritual here. That's what I'm trying to do. So if you want to get into the beginning place of getting closer to God in your quiet time or in, in your, during the course of your day, the way to do it, it begins with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is so important. You say, oh my goodness, I have so much going wrong in my life. What do I have to be thankful about? Oh my goodness. The Bible tells us. It says, He is God. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. That's something to be thankful about. He made us. That's something to be thankful about. He made the heavens and the earth. That's something to be thankful about. And you know, it's interesting to me how many scriptures I've looked at in preparation for the larger message, which I'll give another time. Uh, that have to do with someone saying, Lord, you made the heaven and the earth. You made the earth and the heavens. You know? That, that kind of thing is repeated again and again. I mean, of course, we know it's in Genesis 1-1, but people refer back to Genesis 1-1 when they're kind of establishing, Lord, I'm so thankful. You made it all. Right? So we have great cause to be thankful. And, you know, I've made, uh, and this is a fairly recent thing, um, a, a concerted effort to, to be much more thankful when I approach God. That is, to try to begin with thanksgiving and just continually look for things to be thankful for through, through the course of my day. And it's amazing how that just changes things. It changes the atmosphere, you know. Um, my mother, God bless her, uh, she keeps a, a book of thanksgiving, and she writes in it every day things she's thankful for in that day. And she said she never runs out. Never runs out of things to be thankful for. So, okay, that's how we enter through the gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So when you move through the courtyard, it's praise. Lifting up our hands, worshiping him. But particularly it's verbal acknowledgement of who he is. That's what praise is all about. And we should be doing that. Following the Thanksgiving, we should be talking about Him and how wonderful He is. And you know, I, I uh, have noted that in recent years, 
with some of the so-called contemporary songs of today, there's kind of a lack of praise of God. There's way too much looking internally. Like, oh God, you know, I got so many problems and I know you're a chain breaker and you see chain breaker in about every other song. And, you know, please lift my burdens and all this. And it's all kind of self-focused, you know. And I understand how we can feel that way at times, but we need to look at him. You know, remember in the wilderness when they were getting bitten by serpents? What did God instruct them to do? He instructed Moses, you make a brazen bronze serpent, you put it on a pole, and when they look to it, they'll be healed. What a weird thing for God to do. He who said, make no graven image. But he did it this time for a specific reason. Because for one thing, it's looking forward to Christ who would be on that cross and he took our sins and the curse for us. And when we look to him, we're saved. And when the Jews, bitten by serpents, look to that serpent on the cross, on the pole, essentially like a cross, um, they would be saved. But if they wouldn't look, if they always looked at their snake bites, they wouldn't be saved. And that's sometimes our issue. We don't look to him, we look too much at the problem. You know, we need to take try, and it's hard. You know, you got a snake bite. What do you want to do? You want to look at that snake bite. You want to try to, you know, put a suction cup on it or something, pull that venom out. You want to, you know, you're just so focused on the issue. But the salvation is in seeing Jesus. So we enter His courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. His faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 95 gives us a little bit more direction. Turn to Psalm 95. O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Hey, there's that thanksgiving. That's where we get started. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. That's to me, praise. So many of the psalms are praising God. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. This is all praise right in here. In whose hand are the depths of the earth, the peaks of the mountains are also his. And here comes that same thing, acknowledgement of his creation, his creative works. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Then it says, and this is an important thing, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. So as we move from the courts into the holy place, into his very presence there, we turn away from the praise. Well, it's not that the praise isn't still in our hearts, but we turn to worship. And worship is more an attitude than a verbal thing. And a lot of times when you're in the heavy presence of God, you don't even want to speak. You hardly can speak. And that's the place of his presence where it's our attitude of love and adoration. Worship is adoration of the Lord. It's a heart attitude. And in fact, I don't think it's until we start to really get close to his presence that we can really do that well. You know, it's kind of like we love because he first loved us. You know, we can adore him because he loves us first. And so it's in his presence that the worship really springs forth, like just like a well that wells up in us. And that's how we come into his presence. And you know, I think there's a reason why that little altar of incense was outside that curtain. Because that incense of worship, representing worship, had to be going up before you step through the curtain into God's holy presence. So he gives us tips in these psalms. This is how we should be thinking when we try to approach him. We should make a concerted effort to start with thanksgiving, to go through the courts with praise, and to get to the point where we worship. And if we just want to have a five-minute quiet time every day, we're not going to get there. You know, it takes some time to do that. It's not something that can be done in an instant. Uh, Approaching God is not a microwave event. You just don't put it in, you know, hit the button, and wait a minute. Um, so, worship is a place of loving on God and receiving his love. It's where he becomes the center of it all, 
not me or my needs. But it's where all our needs will be met. You know, it's amazing how much God moves when we worship. Very often, prophecies come forth out of the worship. Very often, healings come forth out of the worship. You know, we, Valida and I have seen this. We were at a conference, and it was a conference on healing uh, up in Connecticut once. And uh, in the middle of worship, I mean, they hadn't gotten to the teaching about healing or praying for people about healing or anything. The whole conference was about healing. This guy went up, wanted to give a testimony. And he'd had an arm that was kind of locked in this position because he had some broken joints or something that had healed wrong. And he said at work they called him the teapot man, you know, because kind of like the teapot handle, you know. And the Lord healed him instantly just during worship. No prayer. Nothing needed. And then there was a, another one um, that I heard that was really wonderful. And I don't know, did I play that here or not? Did I play the Hattie Hammond recording? Yeah, I did. Remember the Hattie Hammond recording? where there was this woman who had burned lungs and they were worshiping and this woman was that was brought in was screeching. <gasps> you know, she was breathing like that. She could hardly breathe. And uh, Hattie immediately wanted to pray for her, but God said, no, stay in worship. And so they did. And during the worship, she was healed completely. Worship is a place where we focus on God. He'll take care of us. So that's my message. Mini message before the message. The message will come another time. Lord, Oh, I wanted to read, like I said, a little short psalm in uh, benediction. So I'll do that. Well, first I'll pray, then I'll read that. It's going to be Psalm 121, if you want to follow along. Lord, thank you for just your grace here among us this morning, your presence. We worship you. We praise you. You're our Lord, our God. You made the heavens and the earth. And we look forward to what more you're going to be doing in our midst in these days coming forward. And thank you for Lori's message this morning. And thank you for the beautiful worship we had early on. Bless us through the week. I pray you watch over all of us, your people, and bring us back together again for more time of pursuing you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I like to read this kind of as a benediction. Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From whence shall my help come? I like that, looking up eyes to the mountains, partly because we live in the mountains. You know, that's great. I like that. But also, because the mountains are, you know, you think if he made heaven and earth, what speaks of that more than the mighty mountains, right? From whence shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in. From this time forth, I mean, right now and forever. Amen.